pull out of the IACP and, uh, you know, basically isolate uh, the negative influence that this organization has, which is not widely known. But I think uh, that would be one way that we could address the problem of these kind of policies being rolled out. Well, I agree. I want to get you on the wider radio show because you, I've been reading your articles. You're extremely informed. I've been nose to the grindstone for 17 years. And I even learned some stuff and went and checked and found out you were telling the truth and it was accurate. And I, I, unfortunately, it's hard for me to learn something new about all the things they're doing because I'm so immersed in it. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Look, let's cut right to the chase before we play some clips. And I want you to elaborate on, on the wider image here. Minnesota, as you know, during the RNC, almost four years ago, they used an Austin uh, Fed front guy. Well, I mean, tell folks about that, because so much we see is happening in Minnesota and in and around Minneapolis, St. Paul as an epicenter. And then now uh, I want to get into the motive after that of why are they doing this? Demonize Occupy, make them look like a bunch of drug mm -hmm. heads, create databases on people, interrogate folks while they're under the yes. truth serum of drugs. I mean, there's so many things going on here. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think the best way to describe the overall Midwest pattern is there's something called the Midwest Green Scare, which a really good reporter, Will Potters, uh, covered in detail. Essentially, there are tons of people uh, working for different federal agencies that are supposedly looking for terrorists, but since they really don't have any terrorists, they can collect what are called, uh, in, in the FBI, statistical accomplishments for hassling people, putting them on watch lists, and that kind of thing. Um, I was recently provided with more than 600 pages of documents from two FBI investigations and uh, you can Google that if you look up uh, COINTEL PRO GOTHIC 2. The first story was called COINTEL PRO GOTHIC and that addresses the operational pattern the FBI has across the Midwest to shadow activists before the Occupy movement started. Um, and, and more broadly, yes, I, I think it's pretty clear they're interested in doing a lot of database collection and that kind of thing and it extends beyond the government as well. Um, there has been a great deal of overt surveillance uh, by, you know, shady parties around the Twin Cities um, in the last couple months. And um, I think it's, you know, it's probably fairly likely that those are people like private security hired by the banks to photograph people uh, and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a high tempo thing. And um, I, I would say uh, looking up uh, a green is the new red scare uh, and checking that out. You can find a lot of information about a, a number of different levels of this type of program going on that started well before Occupy. Well, that's what I discovered more than a decade ago. They go around and just get people to talk about violence or try to imply that peaceful groups are bad to get funding, to justify yes. their existence. And even one of the head federal marshals, air marshals, went public a few years ago in the Denver Post and said, we're ordered to put innocent people on list for what they order. Or if a child takes a photograph, yes. I mean, well, I, I, I mean, it's almost like, exaggerating foreign military threats to get spending. It's, it's, it's creating a domestic it is, it threat. Is, mm -hmm. It is absolutely a, a domestic version of, you know, crying wolf and problem reaction solution type operations. Um, in the last several years, I've run into at least uh, four people that turned out to be FBI operatives. And um, I set up one of the, uh, essentially the original IRC chat channel for Occupy Wall Street when it started, because I've been involved in the live video team uh, since the very first day everything got rolling. And within a couple of weeks, uh, the FBI sent their controlled hacker, Sabu, onto my channel to kind of, you know, lurk as an identity. Um, so the FBI is really all over things, and their uh, operational pattern clearly involves planting informants, um, such as uh, Brandon Darby was the one uh, who was set up in Texas uh, to uh, create a threat during the RNC, and um, this case in Cleveland, which was on the exact same operational pattern. So there's really no regulation of what the FBI does in these situations, but whenever they create anything like this, uh, they can accumulate statistical accomplishments, and we can only find out about that through freedom of information requests. And that That's right. They're not, they're not infiltrating truly dangerous or bad groups. They're getting the underwear bomber on the plane in Amsterdam so Chertoff can make money on body scanners. They're right. going out and finding mentally ill prisoners, welfare people, mentally retarded people uh, on record to then pay them sometimes for years to get them to just talk about an attack and then, and then viciously sending them to prison yeah. when they really need to be in a hospital. Uh, and, but but uh, are, are you excited about the fact that suddenly it's all over mainstream news that the FBI creates its own terror threats and then, and then stops them? 
I mean, this is, yeah, this is a subject that I've tried to look at very carefully for many years that happens across the political spectrum. So I'm glad that that's being publicized too. But I would add, in the case of this whole DRE program, uh, the war on drugs has really offended me for a long time. I've tried to get uh, officials at the state, local, county level to talk about the consequences of drug prohibition creating financial corruption in the banking system. Wells Fargo is a very powerful player in this city, and they're, you know, well known to launder billions of dollars of drug money, and I can't get any officials on the record to explain if we have a Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis and it conducts wire transfer payments, like who is responsible for dealing with the financial corruption in those wire transfer payments? It's the people at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, uh, which is part of the Department of Public Safety, which is involved in this whole scandal, they uh, do not deal with the Federal Reserve. They have no access to those Yeah, systems. let's be clear. So they, they, they pull teenagers over and take them to jail for one joint. Right. Meanwhile, Bloomberg reported Wells Fargo and its subsidiary Wachovia in two years laundered $376 billion. And then you've got the state police trying to get kids and people on drugs and offering them heroin, cocaine. You can have a heart attack on that stuff. And But that's okay. And you're like, hey, th yeah. these guys deal drugs. And they're like, we don't know what you're talking about. It's so obvious. Yeah. They make drugs illegal to keep the price up. But let's stop there. Let me ask you the big question before we go to video clips. Why do you think they have a nationwide program that almost no one knows of? I mean, I know statistics show the DARE program actually gets kid interest, you know, gets children interested in drugs, so they're there advertising it to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and most of the cops are, you know, too ignorant to even understand that, but we understand it, and our viewers understand it. Some of the public doesn't understand it, but expanding on this complex issue, point blank range, covering this, breaking it, why do you think not the reason the cops think, but why are the social engineers, the International Association of Chiefs of Police and all these groups, why are they trying to get people on heroin and cocaine and marijuana? I mean, simply put, uh, chemical dependency is one of the most effective means to control people. And so the, the DRE program clearly uh, seems to be intended to introduce officers to the idea of controlling people through chemical dependency, saying, I will give you a little bit of what you need uh, in order to get information from you and acclimating that to them, to that type of process. There you go, turning yeah. the cops into drug pushers. This yeah. is how you introduce them. Yeah, but but also too, I think um, part of the reason the videos resonated is because it's a it's a condensation of everything that's disturbing and horrible about the war on drugs from the police. They didn't want to be videotaped because they know they feel guilty about it and they know that it's irresponsible. And well, that that's like through. the troops saying we got to grow opium because we're against drugs mm -hmm. and we load it on the planes, but we put you in jail when you use it. It's all just out in the open now. Yes, it, it is. And so what I, what I'm personally happy that like this appears to have been you know an egregious enough violation to catch on tape and put the case together. And, and other people in other states, I really want to encourage other people to start investigating programs in their own areas. But I'm encouraged because I was really hoping that the Occupy movement could really get at the war on drugs because before the war on terror, the war on drugs was used as one of the main you know, levers to advance the surveillance state, to uh, implement uh, the tracking systems of the military industrial complex into local communities, using uh, federal grant programs with uh, freshly printed debt dollars to send out military hardware into different cities. Um, so the war on drugs has always been used to kind of advance this agenda. And, um, and, and we saw in South America, for example, the regional alliances that they've used to keep the war on drugs rolling are finally disintegrating. So uh, can people like the Occupy movement, liberty movement, you know, truthers, we are changed. Can people uh, expose the different corruption going on? Can we force the different layers of government to account for all the financial corruption and finally quit abusing people? It's the sense of abuse. It's the sense of treating people well, like... Well, it's the oldest it's trick like in the book. It, listen, it's re-legalizing slavery. You can't just mm -hmm. grab somebody because they're black and throw them on a ship because, you know, you misinterpret the Bible and say they're the devil and deserve it. Now you just put out a substance you know is addictive, you bring it in, you keep it illegal to jack up the price, and when they use it, you throw them in your prison for 25 cents an hour, putting everybody else out of business and driving down the wages. We were just showing while you were talking video of you there talking to the police. Uh, I want to go to this first clip where they take a young man away. He comes back obviously very inebriated, but from your research, and I looked this up, they admittedly give them cocaine, heroin, LSD. We have no idea the providence of these drugs or where they got them. Is this some crap they got in the locker? Well, you know, right. Uh, 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 marijuana, all of this. I thought this is so deadly that we've all got to have the government, you know, basically taking our freedoms away. But what are they doing? Again, preying on Occupy Wall Street like a shuttle bus drugging everybody up. Yeah.
Well, it, it, it simply put, there's a, you know, because of the abusive nature of the war on drugs type bureaucracies, there are a number of different options that police departments have had across the country since Occupy started to try to create problems for the movement. So here, uh, last fall uh, in Minneapolis, uh, they would definitely drop off people that were very intoxicated at the Occupy site. Um, and it was pretty well known in New York that the NYPD was dropping off uh, intoxicated people, telling them to concentrate essentially in the Occupy space while they were intoxicated in one way or another, or people that were And by the way, that's not your opinion. I mean, in Austin, they admitted yeah. they were dumping upwards of 50 drunks a day, saying, we won't take you to jail, come here. They were drump, dumping the mentally ill, everybody, and then yeah. saying, look at it, they're having fights. Well, right, exactly, and so, um, right, and there, so there were fights in the last couple of weeks, and there was there was uh, you know an allegation of a sexual assault, and so the question is, was the person who committed that sexual assault had they just been through that program a couple hours earlier? Because that would mean that all of these law enforcement parties were directly liable for that sexual assault, and and I think you can see how when this program is running, it really shifts the atmosphere in the whole space. It becomes a total distortion. That's why it's it's MK Occupy Minnesota. It's what happens when a, a government program with no oversight is rolled out. Um, and, and I think that uh, the reason that it has this nature that comes across in the video is simply because the war on drugs is so intrinsically abusive. It, tr it trains police to treat people like objects. And, not and by the way, like treatment, not talk, treat with them like human beings, you know, I agree. But the, look, I've studied and I know you have MK Ultra, MK Naomi, mind control uh, in, in the late. 50s, early 60s, the CIA throwing shoot cases of LSD into mm -hmm. the University right. of Texas down the road and Harvard and Theodore yeah. Kaczynski was part of that program and mind control programs and 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 government uh, releasing the the uh, recipe for crack cocaine. That's all declassified. Mm -hmm. I mean, here they are, and these cops are compartmentalized. They're just like we're doing a training program to see what drugs look like. Oh, give me a break. They're being taught to be drug pushers. This is outrageous. Well, and, and here's, if I can uh, back it up for a second, I think uh, the idea of people should try to understand, regardless of their standpoint, is that we are all uh, enmeshed in a, a web of power at, at different levels and different ways and different assumptions we make and, and who we're linked to and everything. But when people uh, get flipped or taken over by the system, when they're turned into informants or peons or whatever you want to call it, um, um, it's happening because they're in a weak point in that web of power. And so here in the video, we can see people that are like far enough down that they that the law enforcement's being trained to get at them and then flip them over. And and you know, that's essentially, generally speaking, I think the pattern that we should all try to look for. No, you know, no, it's, no, it's no, no. I think that's the out. answer. Look for people they can provocateur and set up, generally assess them, create files on everyone, but find out who can be informants and provocateurs because now the cops are giving you cash, money, cigarettes, and cocaine. Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, it's it's been a rough ride with the Occupy movement. It's had its 